I'm David Wiesel, and I have to tell you that Dr. Borello's wrong about one thing, the last statement about Dr. Bodros. Because <laughs> Dr. Bodros was in Arkansas after I was, and if anyone has been doing transplant longer, it's me. I'm the elder statesman here. <laughs> So Dr. Bodros didn't cut his transplant teeth till after I'd already been doing them for years. So I am uh, privileged to speak to you today. I want you to know when you look at the, the schedules, they are kind of unique agenda. And Greg said that he specifically wanted us to re recapitulate what some of the previous speakers said. So you're going to get a lot of overlap because a lot of Dr. Borello's slides, I have in my slide deck, and I probably have some of my slides in Dr. Bodros' slide deck. I'm certain I do. So just be prepared that the more, the off, more often you see it, the, supposedly the better you learn it. So just keep that in mind when you go like, why is this guy saying the same thing? He wanted us to do this, so for those people that take a little uh, extra time to, to actually you know, apply this information and retain it, it'll be good for you. So I'm actually in two places and I, and I work in two areas. I do 80% myeloma and I do 20% transplant, but I do it both in Hackensack, which is a private group, and I also do it down the road at Georgetown. So I'm in both places and yeah, I, I commute back and forth, I don't want to get into that. So today, we're going to talk about a couple different topics. Some of them you've already heard about. We're going to start off with bone disease. So bone disease is not a good thing to have. Unfortunately, 85% of you, if you use the more sophisticated testing available to us in this room, will have some form of bone disease. And I don't know if does, uh, he walked out of the room. I don't know if Greg provides slides. Do they get copies of our slides if they want them? Yeah, yeah, we I mean, I, you guys, you know, take, I see people taking pictures. Yeah, they never come out very good when you do it, because um, I've tried many times. Anyway, there's certainly a lot of issues with bone disease. The one that they always show for medical students taking their boards is this one. This is a, a lateral view of your, of your head, and it shows these holes, and no, nothing leaks out of the bones, and these don't cause any symptoms. But this is the typical... Uh, picture that they show you on all your board exams. But the issue is, is when you have, this is an arm bone, look at this, there's almost no bone left on the side, the cortex is terribly thinned, this person sneezes, coughs, rolls over in bed, they break their bones, it's not a good thing. If there's any major advancement, we can talk about transplant, we can talk about um, <clears throat> all the new drugs that are going to be um, addressed later in the day, probably the most important um, intervention and improving the life of you folks in the audience has not been so much the drugs, it's not been transplant, it's been the bone hardening medicines. The zoledronic acid, which you all know as Zomeda, or for those of you who've had disease for a very long time, if we've got any really old timers, they may have gotten iridia or permidronate. And of course the new one on the block, which I'm going to talk about, is a little bit different concept the way it works, is Exgeva or denosumab. Those Drugs have decreased the risk of getting problems with your bones, and that's actually improved your quality of life more than anything else we've done. Kid you not. So when we talk about bones, <clears throat> we find that the myeloma cells themselves don't cause that. that. That last picture I showed you with holes in those bones, those dark areas, that's not because there's big masses of myeloma cells there. There's actually holes. Somebody, it's sort of like the, I usually use for my patients. I say it's like you're a, a bad golfer. You get on the course, you, you kick a huge divot out of the grass, and the divot goes flying, and the bottom you got a hole. Well, unless you go pick up the divot and put it back in, that hole stays there. The grass will fill in in the bottom, but you're still going to have a hole. That's what happens with your bones. The holes don't really go away. They're holes, but they're not made by the myeloma cells. There actually are mechanisms in your body that tell cells in your body called osteoclasts, which I think is my next picture. Uh, osteoclasts are cells in your, bone, in your bones that eat bones. They're like Pac-Man cells. They go around, they eat bones, they eat bones, they eat bones, they eat bones. But there are another, offsetting it normally, another cell in your body called an osteoblast, which tells your bones to make bones. So you normally have a balance between eating bones and making bones, and you don't get holes. In myeloma, the myeloma cells send an AT&T signal to the osteoclast and tell them to eat too much bone. They keep eating bone, and until you cut off that signal and kill myeloma cells so they, the AT&T goes away, they keep eating bone. And therefore, the bones get weak, weak bones can break, causing a variety 
of fractures and the most common place to get it is in the spine more than anywhere else. Part of that is because as we get older, our bones get a little bit more washed out. At the end of this bone section, I'm going to tell you what you should all be doing to manage good bone health. And the next one is just showing this. Uh, this is the Pac-Man cell. This guy down. Oop, whoa. This guy down here at the bottom is the Pac-Man cell. Kind of almost looks like the Pac-Man guy. And this is the one that eats bone and lets the bone go. But it's actually not a direct effect from the myeloma cells. Well, there's a variety of different ways you can image bones, and most of you in this audience are quite aware of these and probably have had many of these tests. You can have plain x-rays, as the one on the far left is again another skull which is peppered with holes in the skull, and again it really doesn't cause any symptoms at all. The next is MRIs, which most of you hate. You have to be put in a small tube unless you go to the open MRI. It clangs the whole time. It's not a fun test to have. We can do CT scans, which are quicker, and the most recent testing that we can do are PET CTs. So there's different tests. They can come up with different information, um, and they're used for different um, types of information that we need to help guide your therapy and what to do about any type of issues you may have. This is showing you what happens with some of the areas we can see in this one that we've got, a, this is a scrunched vertebral bobby. So you've fractured that vertebral body. I'm going to show you later on what we're going to do to try to fix that vertebral body. So it doesn't show up as well on the regular film. It shows much more pronounced on this particular one, which is a uh, CAT scan. This one over here, the PET scan, shows a bunch of places where you see some bright lights, if you will, sort of like a Christmas tree. These are probably little tumors. And the one advantage of the PET CT is that when you do a PET CT, it's sort of like a light bulb. Think of uh, the old time lamps that have three-way light bulbs, 50, 100, 150 watt light bulbs. When you do, when you get treated, the light bulb hopefully goes from 150 to zero, completely turns off. Sometimes it goes from 150 to 100. Sometimes it goes 150 to 50. And you can measure how bright the light bulbs are with the technology we have today. So we hope to see those spots go away completely, because when they do, that's a very good thing. It means we've killed all the spots in your body. So there are different ways and different information we get for these tests, and that's shown on here. And I do hope that they just, instead of me, uh, I really don't have time to go into these things in any detail. I apologize. I hope they, people that want it can get my slide set, because you can just have it and, and use it at your own leisure. So there are certainly a number of tests, and they do have different uses. For people that have tumor masses, which we call plasma cytomas, the best test for that is a PET-CT. For people that have problems with their nerves, the best test is an MRI. The, I really don't recommend, it's still part of our standard treatment to do with the whole body, the head, the chest, the arms, the pelvis and stuff like that, but that's like using a black and white TV. Um, none of us in this room probably still have black and white TVs, but conventional x-rays are about that sophistication versus the 4D plasma TV, which is a PET-CT. And there are a lot of other different technologies being developed, which my colleagues, I don't know, do you guys have whole body low-dose CTs at your centers? I, we, we don't either, which is really the way to go. We should get rid of the, uh, of the plain uh, x-rays. So they're, they're used, they're different technologies that give you different pieces of information. Yes, some, almost all of you have a regular x-rays of your whole body. Some of you may get C, uh, MRI, some of you may get PET-CT, some of you may get all of them. They give you different pieces of information. So they're not trying to run up your bill. We don't get any kickback from it. It's there's because we're looking. So we can know what's going on in your body in its entirety. So these, when you look at these tests, the MRI and the PET-CT, these, these are not particularly new anymore. They, they can actually be very valuable as far as not only seeing where you have disease, but also seeing when your disease goes away. I've already told you sort of like the three-way light bulb, we want it to go from 150 to completely turned off. Well, there are now data that says if we do that, you do better long term. So there was a study that was done in France. The French do ungodly numbers of studies. And what they showed is if you were MRI negative, which is shown on the top here, Patients who are MRI negative do better than people who are MRI positive. So if the disease goes away by MRR, you do better. 
When you look at PET CTs, the patients who have PET CTs that are negative do better than the patients who are PET CT positive. So this led to new classification, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, about how we define responses in myeloma. But now there is, we, Dr. Borello talked about minimal residual disease, getting down to the 10 to the minus 6, which is 1 to, 100, 1 to a million cells. That's in your bone marrow. But there's now considered to be minimal residual disease defined by PET and MRI, which is shown down here. And this is part of our current uh, criteria for determining how well you've responded to the therapy. So if you do get rid of all the stuff in your bone marrow, you get rid of everything on your x-rays, you're sitting pretty. Okay? And this is just another level to tell us how well you did and it predicts how long you're going to do well as well. So when you deal with different um, treatments, I already mentioned Zometa, Zoledronic Acid, Pomidronate, Iridia, the new kit on the block, which is approved four or five months ago, is denusumab or Exgeva. For those of you in this room that have osteoporosis, um, you may know this drug by its other name, which is Prolia, which is approved for osteoporosis. But in malignancies, we call it Exgeva. It's made the same company. The dosing schedule is a little bit different, but it's the same, essentially the same dose. I'm not going to go over the mechanisms of how these drugs work. I don't have time, given the restricted schedule. But I will tell you that this was approved, because this is kind of interesting information. This just was published just recently uh, in one of our major journals. They did a trial of Zometa versus Exgeva. And it was a very large trial. As you see here, there's 1,700 patients in this trial. And they did the Exgeva every month. They did the Zometa every month, and they decided to find out which group did better if, if there was any improvement in one group or the other. And what has actually happened is the way the trial was designed is they actually wanted them to come out, they were hoping they would come out the same. The company that makes Exgeva is Amgen, and they actually wanted the trial to come out the same or they'd be better. But it wasn't really, they didn't expect actually one to be necessarily better than the other because they had a very old trial that showed that they were about the same. It was a wash, but it was a very small study. So this is a very large study, and sure enough, these curves are superimposable. There was no benefit from one over the other in helping your bone health. But what was interesting with this trial, which was not seen in any other trial with these kinds of drugs, is the patients that were getting the Exgeva actually had a longer remission by 10 months. And they don't know why. But there was a 10-month improvement in remission duration for the Exgeva arm than the Zometa arm. When they looked at the overall survival, how long you survived, there was no difference. So you stayed in remission longer, but you didn't live longer. They're still trying to figure out, unless my colleagues know why this is the case, they're still trying to figure out why this happened. There was an older trial that was done in the UK where the opposite was found using a different, with, with Zometa versus a different drug. They found that the patients who had Zometa actually had an improvement in their um, survival but didn't improve their progression-free survival. They, they still showed it, but those are the only two trials I'm aware of that there's been a PFS or an OS difference. Is that what you guys, yeah, I don't know why that is. So what was interesting also with this trial is that the, some of you know that there's side effects from getting drugs, right? Any drug. Well, there's side effects from getting Zometa. Some of you get the flu, some of you get, you know, fevers. Um, it rarely can cause kidney problems. I'm going to talk a little bit more about, actually, Dr. Badros is one of the first people in the country to describe the problem with the jaw. Um, but it also, Zometa can also cause some kidney problems. When they looked at kidney problems between the Zometa and the Exgeva, they actually found that the Zometa caused more problems with kidneys, 17% versus 10%, than the Exgeva did. So Exgeva can be given in patients on dialysis and any level of kidney problem. For the Zometa, it has to be dose adjusted for people with kidney problems. So it, where it's all going to fit in, I'm not sure any of us yet, know yet. So these are some of the toxicities oops, that you can see. You can get muscle aches, you can get fevers. Um, it can cause some renal toxicity. The one I'm going to talk about a little bit more, don't get grossed out in the next picture, 
Um, I actually think it may be um, uh, Dr. Badros may have been involved with this study that I'm going to show you next, but he was actually one of the first people to describe this thing called osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is exposed dead bone. It's not very common. It's less than 5%. It's almost always associated with people having invasive dental work done. Invasive, not getting your teeth cleaned, but people having teeth pulled and the like are the ones that are most common. And if you have questions during our discussion, he's actually the expert on this. You can ask him. But it, it can cause that kind of problem. And um, it's really not good. The question is, should you stop the drug before you have dental work? There's really no proof that stopping the drug, some of us give us three months break before, three months after. There's no scientific basis for doing that, to the best of my knowledge. Our oral surgeon gentleman uh, uh, by the name of Dr. Fleischer in New York sees all the all the osteonecrosis in the whole New York area. He says it doesn't matter if they need treatment, you treat them. But I'll leave that further discussion to Dr. Badros. What we do recommend is that you get your teeth checked, preferably before you get started on the Zometa. Both the Zometa and the Xgeva, I skipped over that very quickly, both of them can cause this. It's not restricted just to the X, to Zometa. Xgeva can do it as well. This, there was no difference in the incidence in this osteonecrosis. So you should get your teeth checked before you start these drugs, if at all possible. One of the big questions which many have asked ask us, the patients, but so do all their doctors ask us, is how long should we treat people for? And no one's got a real good answer for this. This is from the International Myeloma Working Group, which all three of your speakers here today are members of. There's 220 of us or something like that. And they recommend that, that you can continue this in, continue this monthly is their recommendations for two years. And if you're after two years, if you're in remission or in a very good partial remission, you can discontinue the drug. When the disease acts up again, you should go back on it. That being said, this just came out just this month um, from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. It was headed up by Ken Anderson, our uh, esteemed colleague from uh, Dana-Farber, and they essentially said the same thing. You should be treated for up to a period of two years. For those patients who have, that after two years, drugs should be resumed upon relapse or new episodes of problems with your bones. So this is kind of where we're at with that. No one really knows if you need to stay on it every month, every three months, every six months. I generally give it till every month till they have their transplant, then they give it to them every three months or two years, and I switch them to every six months. But I'm just winging it. So what should we do? This is true for all the people, caretakers and patients with, my, patients with myeloma. Um, as we get older, for reasons I don't know, we don't get enough sunlight because vitamin D deficiency is fairly common. So you really should get your, your primary care doctors probably check your vitamin D levels where they should because it's very simple to supplement that. It's, it's, it is much more common in older individuals. So the current recommendations for vitamin D is if you're really deficient, you should get, you have to have a prescription, you get 50,000 units a week or you can get 100,000, um, I think 100,000 units a month. But in general, um, when you're getting, if you're vitamin D deficient, you should be taking uh, calcium with it. And what's shown in the next one is actually the current recommendation that general individual in the room needs between 1,250 and 1,500 milligrams of calcium and between 800 and 1,200 units of vitamin D. So if you buy the combined pill, the caltrates, I think it's two of them a day. And that's what you really should get for your bone health. Now, the only exception to that is people that show up in the clinic with active myeloma and high calciums, they shouldn't be taking calcium till their myeloma is under control. The other thing I want to show you about, this is impossible, Greg, to do this. The other thing I want to show you about is kyphoplasty. I showed you the initial, all these x-rays. Somebody had a broken back, bone in their back. There's a procedure. It usually does an outpatient. It sounds very gruesome. It's not. It's called kyphoplasty. There's probably people in this room. Anyone in this room had kyphoplasties? Yeah, this is it's really not a minor thing. It can fix 70 to 80% of people. If you have a compressed fracture, it actually was originated for people with osteoporosis. You know, the hunched up old lady with the dowager humps, they decided that they 
uh, had to fix up some of these people. They stick needles in, they blow up balloons, they squirt cement in, they expand the bone, and that relieves the pain. It's not, com not always complete, doesn't always work, but in the vast majority of people, this is unbelievably helpful to have this done. It can be done anytime. We sometimes do them one day, we treat them with their chemotherapy the next day. Radiotherapy is used very infrequently, at least in my experience, you, because the bowls, bones have holes in them. I'm not sure why we want to give radiation therapy to something that's a hole. All your radiating is a dead space. But some of the local doctors like to use radio, radiation therapy. Most of the myeloma doctors don't use it except for usually with soft tube, with, with tissue masses, plasma cytomas, or nerve damage that they may think this will help. Briefly, I really don't have time to get through this, Myeloma is not all treated, is not all the same. Um, everyone's not created equal. Um, there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly myeloma. Some of this has already been alluded to and it's gonna be again partly repetitious. The old staging system from 1975 from Brian Dury, and Dury, uh, Brian Dury and Zid Salmon was very complicated, the, the one on the left. Um, interestingly, the people that had bad bone disease were, were automatically a stage three. You see here, multiple lytic lesions, we thought that was the, when they first came up with the staging system, we thought that was because there was higher tumor burden and people have bone disease, that's not the case. So that was taken out of and found out not to be appropriate. So a lot of those patients we downgraded. Dr. Borello already talked to you about beta-2 microglobin and albumin. He talked to you about how they work. And this is one of these cartoon things that take forever. So you can have this beta-2 microglobin, which is on the surface of myeloma cells, the albumin, which is a measure of the activity of the myeloma cells, and you come up with three stages. Um, you either have one or three and two is by exclusion. As Dr. Borello already mentioned to you as well, there's a new staging system that's called the International Staging System, the Revised International Staging System. It's based on your LDH, which is an enzyme that myeloma cells make, and it's based on the genetic makeup of the myeloma. So down here we have the genetic risk factors, deletion 17, 414, or 1416. So if you have either a high beta-2 microglobulin and either an LDH and or high risk side genetics, you're now a stage three. So this is trying to bring in more of the biology of the disease rather than just simple blood tests. Dr. Brello showed you, and I actually have one of my other slides, this idea of minimal residual disease. We'd like to get to the bottom of the cone and try to do that uh, as easily as we can. So this is actually the most confusing aspect of myeloma in the world is how we determine what your responses are. And this is true. If you think, this, you have to keep in mind if you have leukemia, just for example, you either have leukemia or you don't have leukemia. There's not an intermediate. Well, in myeloma, we've got all these different levels of how we determine how much disease you have, plus the MRD, plus the x-rays. So there's all these very complicated ways we determine what your response is to therapy. And it's confusing to you, it's confusing to us, and some of the systems are not very good. The free light chains, for example, are a mess, because there's, no, there's only PR and stringent CR for free light chain assessments. It's very, very difficult, and people outside the myeloma field really haven't got a clue how to, to do this. But I, again, due to time, I'm going to skip that because he's gonna raise his hand. Um, this, is the, this is the basis for MRD testing. Briefly, Dr. Borello mentioned this as well. There are karyotypes. You all did this in biology when you were probably in seventh and eighth grade. You probably cut out chromosomes. There's 23 pairs. That's what's shown on the left. On the right, there's somebody who's got too many chromosomes. Too many chromosomes, as he already told you, is a good thing in myeloma. This is in your myeloma cells, not your regular cells. There's another test which you all have heard about, FISH, which is painting your cells, looking for abnormalities, that's essentially what they do. It's the simplest concept is they're painting the cells, looking to see what's in there, and they have different paint colors for different abnormalities. You may have, it's, it's not literally that way, but they have different probes for 414s, for, for 17Ps, and for other abnormalities. And he already mentioned to you about gene expression profiling. So the side genetic risk is shown here. 
And the outcomes on the, what they had been in the past are on the bottom. If you have high-risk disease, we've made some headways in high-risk disease. He already told you about this one called 414. Used to be in over here in the blue one. It's now in the intermediate one because of the use of proteasome inhibitors. Proteasome inhibitors are Velcade, Carfilzim, Kyprolis, and Ninlaro. And if you treat patients with one of those drugs, it switches it from a, a blue box to an orange box. And then there's the standard risk people who in this current day probably live 12, 15 years or more. Yeah. When I first started doing this before my colleagues, because I was already mentioned I'm the oldest, <laughs> um, when I first started doing this, the average lifespan for a myeloma patient was two and a half years. Two and a half years. Um, and it really sucked. And thank God we've, we've made unbelievable progress since then. Um, you, some people may say, well, how often do these happen? The, probably the worst one to have, everyone thinks the worst one to have is 17P, because that's the most common of the bad ones for the most part, the real bad ones. But actually, my experience with 1416 and, and 1420, which are really rare, have, have much worse outcomes. So these are not very common. About 20, 25% of the patients have high-risk disease based on the genetic makeup of their myeloma. You've already seen a slide like this. This is combining their stage with different with the 414. The line at the top looks pretty good. That's patients who have stage one and no 414. The line at the bottom are those who have stage three and have a 414. They do not do well. That being said, when you look at what happened in the next slide, this was the addition of adding uh, Velcade to a regimen. This is Arkansas data. It's very confusing. I really don't want to go over it. But this blue line up here is similar to the difference between the blue line and the red line are those patients in the blue line got Velcade compared to the patients in the red line that didn't. So when we added Velcade, we changed the outcomes in patients. The same thing is undoubtedly true for Kyprolis, Carfilzomib, and probably for Exasmib or Ninlaro. And I just want to end up, because I'm supposed to talk about this, this is to lead into Dr. Bodrus's talk to make his uh, talk rep, um, also recapitulate for you. This is a trial that was presented um, at our last meeting in December. Um, what they had was three arms. It doesn't look like it's three arms, but there are three arms. One arm was no transplant, and the second arm was two, one transplant. The third arm was three, two transplants. So no transplant, one transplant, two transplants. And I don't want to go over the details. I'll just tell you the line on the top here is the group that got transplants. Transplants beat no transplants. Okay? But what was also interesting in this trial is two transplants beat one transplant. Okay, so for those of you particularly that go to the closest university to where we are right now, which is Hopkins, I think. <laughs> is he closer? Maryland. Maryland's closer. So the Hopkins folks, uh, Hopkins, they can fight it out because um, Hopkins doesn't really believe in two transplants. I think that Dr. Badros of Maryland might feel in two transplants. So two transplants beat one transplant. Okay, and not only that, if you had high risk disease, so this is the group that had two transplants. If you had high-risk disease, that's down here, patients with high-risk side genetics, if you only had one transplant, the likelihood of being in remission at three years was 44%. If you had two transplants, you improved that by 25%. Okay? So two transplants in their study were better than one transplant. This is one versus two, is 64% versus 72%. But if you had high risk disease in particular, you had an improvement in outcome. 44% likelihood of being in remission in three years versus 70%. That sounds really, really great. But we did the same kind of trial in the United States. And this is where it gets unbelievably confusing. And in the United States, it didn't work that way at all. It was a wash. The Europeans, the trials are both large. The Europeans said, you've got to have two. It works for all patients, and it works for patients with high-risk disease. When we did two versus one, there was no difference. When we looked at high-risk versus standard risk, there was no difference. So now that you're confused with that, <laughs> I, I want to make sure you learn a lot here that we don't know what we're talking about. There is, there is um, certainly 
uh, a variety of different technologies. Um, we don't have anyone here from Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic is a superb institution. There's three of them, for those that don't know that. Between the three institutions, there's about 35 myeloma doctors, not three like we got sitting here. And they come up with ideas of how they want to approach disease. And they've come up, because the question is, what do you do for the different risk groups? Can you treat them different based on how, what the risk stratification is? Oh.